Oh, your face. Good evening. I'm Tiff Beatty, Associate Director at the National Public Housing Museum. I'm really excited to be here with you all. Thanks for uh, dropping your locations in the chat. Um, we're also gonna open with the land acknowledgement um, and then we'll get into our agenda. So if you also um, are familiar with uh, the native land that you're residing on, uh, please feel free to share that in the chat. We'll also drop a link if you'd like to look that up. Uh, the National Public Housing Museum is located here in Chicago. Uh, where I am also um, currently located. Uh, we wanna start by acknowledging that the land where we reside is a sacred living being. Um, we have respect and um, also acknowledge the roots of this land. Uh, so the museum is um, occupying the traditional homelands of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, the Potawatomi people, and many other indigenous nations uh, who are the current and past and future caretakers of the land. Uh, we recognize that acknowledgement's a critical public intervention and a necessary step towards honoring native communities and enacting a much larger project of decolonization and reconciliation. I and mean, as the National Public Housing Museum, we also acknowledge the displacement of public housing residents all over the country and particularly here in Chicago under uh, the plan for transformation and also the ongoing uh, defunding of public uh, housing and public initiatives more broadly. Um, and so this is part of a, a big sort of ethos of the organization and, and the mission and vision um, of the organization uh, that you'll hear a little bit about tonight, but we uh, encourage you all to continue digging into some of these concepts. And I'm sure uh, just because of the nature of the conversation, many of you are also very familiar um, with this and, and can bring a lot to um, this ongoing project that we're involved in. So thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna uh, review the agenda and then um, I'll also introduce you to some of our other NPHM staff members who are here. Um, and just to clarify, the NPHM is an acronym you might hear us say, stands for the National Public Housing Museum. Um, and we uh, are also, all of our social platforms are at the NPHM. So if you hear that acronym, that's so what we're referring to there. Um, so we want to introduce you to the, the museum, but again, we're online and also we have a lot of programming out there. So we want to really also encourage you all, if this is your first time interacting with us, uh, to check out our programming and our content, which we'll also share with you all at the end. Um, but we'll a brief overview of who we are as a museum, what we do beyond this, this residency, um, and talk uh, a little bit more about arts, culture, and public policy and, and why we take this approach. Uh, we want to share a little about some of the previous artists, projects, and partners uh, that we have facilitated through or worked with and, and facilitated um, programs with and, and projects with, as well as, um, you know, under this program, as well as other, other programs that we run at the museum. Uh, and so from there, so sort of the general overview, then we'll get right into the weeds, uh, which is why I think most of you all are here is to really uh, understand this artist instigator residency and uh, answer some questions. We'll start first with some frequently asked questions, some that we've come up with and, and that we've heard from folks um, you know, over the, the last few years. And then uh, we will open it up to you all. We'll stop sharing our screens and, and get to see each other's uh, faces or names at least. Um, and then I will address any of the questions that you all have that we didn't address in the FAQ. But uh, at the same time, feel free to drop any questions in the chat at any time, and we'll try to collect those and keep keep an eye on those and, and address those at the end as well. Um, and some of them we may be able to address throughout the presentation, um, so that will be helpful for us. And then finally, just to recap it or cap it off with uh, how to apply and how to stay connected with the museum um, and our, our work in the meantime. All right, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our wonderful executive director, Lisa Yun Lee, uh, to give an overview of the museum and, and to uh, co-present uh, about the Artists' Instigator Residency with me tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Tiff. Hey, everybody. I'm so glad that you're all here today from all over the nation. Um, as Tiff said, I'm the executive director of the National Public Housing Museum. And I wanna tell you that the museum actually came together out of 
the passionate dream of public housing residents who mobilized and organized in the wake of Chicago's plan for transformation, which was an effort in Chicago in the early 2000s to sort of save public housing, quote unquote. But one of the first actions was the bulldozing of 11 public housing developments that when demolished represented the largest net loss of affordable housing in the history of the United States. Residents came together to save one particular building, which you see on the screen, which is the Jane Addams Homes, in order to save it from demolition to create a museum. And it was at one point the Jane Addams Homes actually consisted of 987 units across 32 buildings, and it was designed by John Holabird, one of our nation's most respected architects. And throughout its history, until 2002, the buildings provided a home for tens of thousands of multiracial working class residents and public housing residents profoundly understood the power of place and demanded a museum that would serve as a visible reminder of the history of public housing, but they also wanted the museum to be a site of resistance against erasure and forgetting, and they felt that there was a really important role for a museum in their struggle for self determination. And for that reason, you know, our programs began with an oral history project and the building of the nation's largest oral history archive uh, in order to preserve public housing stories. Um, and it is also a real call to our nation to have a much more inclusive foundation for the stories that we preserve, we collect, and we disseminate. The museum is part of the International Sites of Conscience, which is a network of museums and historic sites like District 6 Museum in South Africa, the Workhouse um, Museum, uh, and uh, the Gulag Museum in Russia, for example. Um, and as a site of conscience, we believe that you cannot preserve history unless you make it relevant to today's social justice issues and that you can't actually solve and address any of today's most critical social and cultural issues unless you go back in time and ask, what have we not yet learned from history? Um, for that reason, a lot of what we do is, of course, addressing um, housing precarity, which is one of the most critical issues facing us today. But also, as Larry Vale, a scholar, has said, the history of public housing is not so much about housing as it is the history of our troubled relationship with the idea of the public or a commonwealth and this idea of public goods. And so for that reason, even as we, do, we address housing as one of our foremost issues, it really is a lens through which we start to ask critical questions about policing and public safety, about the future of public education, about also um, all other kinds of public health issues um, and public transportation. And so housing just becomes a kind of small um, window in which opens up to a conversation about a whole host of other issues. Cool. Um, one thing that I wanted to say also, which is really important um, is, no, that's good. You can go to the next slide, Mark. Also, there's kind of a Wizard of Oz who's working here. His name is Mark Jaschke. <laughs> He's a sort of shout out to our uh, public program coordinator who's like sort of helping work the slides in the tech today. Um, the thing about us that I think is very unique in the sort of landscape of cultural and civic um, institutions is that we really believe that there's a critical link between arts, culture, and public policy. Um, I love this quote from the hip hop scholar, Jeff Chang, who says, cultural change always precedes political change. Every moment of major social change requires a collective leap of imagination, Political transformation must be accompanied not, not just by spontaneous and organized expressions of unrest and risk, but by an explosion of mass creativity. Sometimes we often quote Tony Cade Bambera too, sort of saying that the work of the cultural organizer and the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. We really feel like there's a strong role and a purpose for arts and culture in order to have creative public policy in our nation. And so we see our work and particularly this um, project, Artists as Instigators, as something that is a unique way for arts culture to link with public policy transformation. Cool. Tiff. 
Oh, maybe should I say one thing, which is just that the museum is actually under construction right now. And so even though we've been sort of working for the last 15 years, we're pushing to be in our permanent building. And, you know, if everything goes okay, we'll be open by late spring in 2024. But our programming and our work continues. We have office site and we also have started to um, do uh, artworks and other things uh, throughout the nation and our oral history archive is also national and so our programming and everything is ongoing but we'll be moving and doing a grand opening of the museum actually in our permanent site with museum with a museum store which was a cooperative that's owned with public housing residents three um, restored apartments from three different generations of public housing residents two large contemporary art galleries a public programming space and a lot of other exhibitions that deal with architecture and the built environment and issues of environmental justice cool um so the Artists as instigator started um, with us actually choosing an artist um, who we knew that was doing incredible work in the city of Chicago named William Estrada, who is a community organizer and also an assistant professor um, at U University of Illinois at Chicago. And his residency sort of helped us to set the framework for um, all of our rest of our projects. William sort of came to us as a community organizer, as someone who does a lot of beautiful screen printing and also has a mobile art cart where he goes through com within communities and he helps to do a lot of different projects. And he said to us, you know, I want to work with housing justice groups and can you help introduce me to these groups because I think I have a lot to offer with the kind of work that I do. At that time, he was also printing lots of different protest signs for CTU, for BLM and other projects. And so what we did is we started doing screen printing workshops with him and um, CHA youth. Um, and then uh, in, in these sort of shirts and the screen prints, we share the profits with uh, CHA, CHA youth and other people as part of our entrepreneurship hub. But then William actually started to attend housing justice um, meetings. And at that time, he said, can you introduce me to some people who are working on critical housing campaigns? And in Chicago, there was something called the Just Housing Initiative that was just starting to be, to be talked about with a coalition of a lot of different organizers. And what it was, was to pass an amendment in Cook County to actually make it illegal to discriminate against people who were formerly incarcerated um, when they were searching for housing, for rental housing um, in the city of Chicago. And so William actually helped, you know, go and create a cohesive campaign uh, with these different groups in solidarity with them. And those um, sort of signs were held up at protest meetings at City Hall. There were postcards that were sent to different commissioners asking them to vote um, in favor of the Just Housing Initiative. And then we were like super excited when December in that year that it actually, you can go into the next slide. Um, the Just Housing Initiative actually passed, led by then Cook County Commissioner Brandon Johnson, who now is the mayor of our great city. Um, and so it was like, wow, there really is a role for an artist with these um, different housing campaigns that are happening. And it doesn't have to be this particular um, sort of campaign, but and it didn't have to be this particular way of working. But it just turned out that because this was William's skill and with the partnership of the museum, uh, he ended up working on this campaign. It was a huge success. Um, in addition to this engagement, William actually also does some does another kind of project, which is takes family portraits of people. So as part of building trust and reciprocity, he would go to some of these meetings and he went to like the holiday party of public housing residents and he took family portraits and gave them to um, different public housing residents as gifts also. So we helped to facilitate a lot of different kinds of interactions with him. And we continue to work with William as well, which is another kind of unique aspect of artist as instigator, like once you're sort of part of the MPHM family and, um, you know, as long as it's a mutual love, we continue to find ways of deploying your art and your work in the public sphere. 
Um, the next artist we worked with was Jen de los Reyes. Um, and she uh, is somebody that some of you may know as the, one of the founders of the social practice conference open engagement. And this was uh, the year when uh, it was both uh, the pandemic was happening and also there was election that was happening. And so Jen was really interested in doing a large scale outdoor work but she also is somebody who's thought a lot about critical generosity and critical care as part of her own practice. And so what she wanted to do was a large outdoor project, but also something much more intimate. And so what we facilitated for Jen was um, these letters that she wrote to thousands of people who were on our mailing list and sort of really making a plea that everyone take the time to go out and vote uh, because like even though electoral politics is not the end all and be all of social movements and social organizing that it was really really important for people to go out and vote and um, as part of this um, sort of invitation which was what the project was called to vote she gave a gift which is um these kind of printed broadsides that were, we are the ones that we've been waiting for on one side, and then this other beautiful poem, just to be alive on this fresh morning in the broken world. And so with the letter and this broadside, it was kind of sent out to, uh, to thousands of people. And it was just a really lovely project as part of an invitation to everyone to vote. Um, as a side note, uh, the next slide, Mark. Um, Jen, you know, was during her residency with us, she was eager to also work with us on another project we have, which is called 36 Questions for Civic Love, which um, is based on a New York Times uh, article about 36 questions that could make you, you know, either fall in love with somebody or realize that you were not destined for one another. We moderated, mod modified that and created civic questions to develop civic love that start from, you know, what is the first sound that you hear in the morning? What's your favorite smell to, you know, would you call the police on your neighbor or, you know, how do you define um, safety? And so we would host civic love events on Zoom and Jen wanted to actually be the kind of civic love um, notary public. And so she made these kinds of civic love certificates for people who participated in civic love events. And so that was like an additional project, just like William's uh, posters that the family portraits he made, Jen also decided that she wanted to do this with us as a sort of limited edition. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. So so I'll jump in here now uh, to tell you all about two other artists that we've worked with. Um, and then again, we'll get into the process uh, so that we can get our next artist as instigator, uh, possibly someone in this room. <laughs> uh, so Tanika Lewis Johnson is uh, the artist that I'm, I'm going to start with. Um, she is someone that, uh, again, was a friend of the museum, someone that we admire from afar. Um, and some of us have actually worked with her on previous projects, including uh, one that she's probably most well known for, although she's been doing this for, for a bit now. Um, but more recently, I think it was 2018, she did an exhibit uh, called the Folded Map Project, um, which again started as a visual art project, but then uh, evolved into something much more. Um, so as you can see, uh, we've got some two photos of two different homes. Um, one is at 6329 South Polina, and the other is at 6330 North Polina. Uh, so the idea is taking a photo of these two homes on the same exact street, um, but in very different um, and in some ways opposite sides of the city. So taking this idea of the Chicago grid, which those of you who are in the room or who have visited Chicago and have learned um, anything about how the city's laid out, we're very proud of, of the grid and how we can navigate the cities uh, based on addresses in this very logical way. Um, as someone who's a transplant to Chicago, I definitely appreciate the grid system. Um, but unfortunately, the grid system also says a lot about our inequity um, and our historical um, segregation um, here in Chicago. And so the differences are very stark, uh, not only along racial and ethnic lines, but socioeconomic and 
um, investment history and, um, you know, from, from government, but also individuals. And, um, you know, there's a lot that's contributed to this history that, that Tanika was visualizing. Um, this project really started with the idea of just capturing this visual and then um, building on that, how we can bridge this gap through an act like folding the map. Um, so not only folding it visually, but uh, connecting people from these different uh, communities that otherwise may not come in contact. And so uh, part of this was creating uh, something that she called map twins and inviting residents from opposite sides of the city in like uh, locations. Obviously one of these homes is abandoned. So, um, but nearby homes um, and, and, and addresses that were similar, but on opposite sides of the city, inviting those folks to come together to get to know each other, to ask each other some questions. Um, for example, um, you know, how did you come to live in your neighborhood? How much does your home cost? Um, is everything in your neighborhood accessible to you? So through conversation and also um, introducing folks to, to other neighborhoods, um, she was able to start a critical conversation for Chicago and in some ways nationally about um, inequity and uh, in particular, Kind of place-based uh, inequality. And from that, she got really curious uh, and also got connected to a lot of different folks uh, who were doing some of this work um, around exposing not only the inequity, but some of the root causes of that. And so that really got her interested in, in history and uh, studies like the one uh, that this map was pulled from called The Plunder of Black Wealth in Chicago Report, uh, which came out of Duke University and also um, the Roosevelt uh, University here in Chicago uh, Policy Research Collaborative uh, worked on it. Um, primarily, someone named Amber Henley, who was a lead researcher, uh, put together this data, which quantified that it was between 3.2 and 4.3 billion, I believe, um, dollars. So billions of dollars that was legally stolen from Black communities in Chicago through a practice that was legal, but in Tanika's, as you can see in her quote here, um, was a legal crime. And so a crime against humanity, uh, something that was uh, detrimental and harmful to Black communities and continues to persist today uh, as this pra practice of land sale contracts, which was also reinforced by practices like redlining, uh, which forced uh, Black folks to live in certain neighborhoods, which enabled uh, speculators and, and, and the real estate industry, banks and so forth to take advantage and discriminate against black families. And so the, through this practice, uh, folks were paying much more than they should be for their homes, but also they were not um, allowed to actually become homeowners because these contracts did not actually transfer ownership to the, the black folks who, who signed the contracts, although they were, um, you know, under the, the assumption that they were homeowners, they were actually um, in these contracts were taken advantage of to the point where they were not able to build local, they were not able to build uh, equity. They were not able to pass these homes down onto, you know, their children. And so this, this inequity continued to, uh, to, to today where we see uh, the impacts of disinvestment of um, you know, lack of home ownership. Uh, this is a map of Inglewood, um, one community here in Chicago that experienced over 600 at least, uh, which is documented, 600 land sale contracts. So more than 600 families who experienced this practice. Um, and as Tanika also points out, it didn't just impact those people, um, but also the people um, who live next door to, for example, some of these boarded up homes whose home values are then impacted. So um, looking at that, Tanika was very interested in not only visualizing it, but having really starting the conversation around um, action and, and what to do about it. And so um, the next slide, her intervention is a visual one, of course, as a visual artist working with architects, designers, um, folks who also have been a part of conversations about landmarks and monuments. Um, this was, you know, not too far after 2020, this was in 2020. 2021, where we were still and, and you know, still are continuing to have these conversations um, with some recent victories here in Chicago around how do we monumentalize our history 
um, in a way that also leads and connects to movements like the reparations movement. Um, so this, this landmarker here is, uh, gives history, it gives a very um, clear definition of uh, what Tanika calls the land sale contract scam, um, what happened, and then on the back there's more information, but also points towards uh, what should happen as a result, which uh, at the bottom it says this crime was never brought to justice, reparations are due, um, and the visual impact with with it being right in the neighborhood so you can actually see um, the effects of this practice that was in the uh, 1963 for this particular home, um, how it continues. And so there's currently a walking tour that the museum continues to offer. It's at Lisa's point of, uh, we are still engaged and having conversations with Tanika about her next landmarker, uh, which she is hoping to actually install in front of the Chicago bank. Um, and calling out the banks and their roles with this. So um, stay tuned for more from Tanika's project. You can also check out the uh, podcast that we did together, which was uh, complimentary content. I think if you hit the button, that'll pop up. Um, we also did a live event. Um, but if you check out the National Public Housing Museum on um, Spotify, Apple, you know all the different podcast platforms, um, we have Out of the Archives, and then we also have Legally Stolen, which is a three-episode series that we produced with Tanika all about this project. Okay, so our current slash uh, soon transitioning artist as instigator is Marisa Moran John. Um, so Marisa was really interesting uh, because she was our first open call uh, applicant with we, uh, last year, 2022 was the first time we opened this up. So you've heard us talk about William and Jen and Tanika. These are all people that we had you know, some relationships with, some connections with. Um, and then you know we decided as a national museum, we really wanted to take advantage of the fact that we do have connections all over the country and we wanna be relevant and um, you know connected with folks that are doing this work and, and make, make more of uh, intentional kind of, um, you know, relationship building across uh, the different work that's happening in different places. And so we put the call out and we've gotten a lot of really great um, connections from, a, from this uh, opening this up. And one of them happened to be our, our artist and instigator, Marissa. Um, so Marissa was really interesting to us for a lot of different reasons, um, a great opportunity to collaborate. And this, what you see on the screen is one of them. Um, we love play and uh, having fun and, and um, you know, these topics sometimes can be very heavy and, uh, you know, just discouraging in some ways to feel like there's always a problem that we have to solve. And so uh, Marisa coming at these uh, conversations around public housing from really a standpoint of uh, thinking about the, the opportunities, uh, both past and current and future, um, that the history of public that we can learn from the history of public housing and and you know it starts from the very beginning uh, when public housing was originally you know built and invested in uh, particularly in the WPA era uh, where not only did we see uh, you know the largest investment in public housing but we also saw investment in other public goods uh, public service uh, dedication to art architecture public um, public art in particular. Um, jobs programs for artists, and so making this connection between art and the public, um, and and also our memories, right, and and those those moments that we can reflect back to that uh, we were able to use our imaginations, um, you know, not only as individuals but as, as communities and, and in some ways as a society. Um, so Marisa is working with us on really thinking through different ways to integrate this history of recreation and play and wonder um, into the museum project itself. As Lisa said, uh, we are very uh, close to, to opening our permanent space. And, and uh, this whole year, really last couple of years has been intently imagining and designing the spaces. And so um, not only doing that through the developing of and designing of the physical spaces, but thinking about ways to tell this story to broader groups of people. So creating things like coloring pages, prints, uh, things that we can share out more broadly so that people get an understanding of kind of what we're all about, what we're looking to build, um, that we're not only interested in talking about the issues and the stigmas 
um, but also the the beautiful things and the the exciting things. And so this uh, these animals that you see the the children playing on uh, were pulled from the Edgar Miller Animal Court, which was uh, here in Chicago, but it was a part of a broader initiative. Uh, so there's animal courts um, historically and, and some that are still existing that have been uh, installed in public housing communities all over the country. And so, um, you know, that's something that is a huge project to think about our, our government investing in artists and public art in public housing in a way it stretches our imaginations to help us think about yeah, what could be possible in the future. Um, and so on a similar note, uh, Marisa is also designing another project uh, called Hoops, which you see on the left, um, which is actually not a part of her artist's instigator residency. It's a part of a new project uh, that's launching as the artist's instigator residency is closing um, as we, through our collaborations and conversations, um, put together a grant where we applied to the Joyce Foundation together and uh, were awarded this commission called Hoops. And so that is enabling us to continue working with Marisa to continue doing this work. And yeah, the Joyce Award, we're really excited. And, and um, you know, this is just sort of one example of uh, how we can, you know, follow our curiosities and our interests and in working with artists and actually get a lot of really good support and, and that, um, that we're excited for the work to continue. And so stay tuned for Hoops, uh, which will be kind of a reimagination of, again, recreation and public housing, building off the history of Midnight Basketball, which was a um, publicly funded program uh, that brought you know, youth, youth into um, to recreation spaces and supported um, those programs. And CHA was had a very unique and special project uh, here that got a lot of really um, you know, good attention and investment. Uh, the housing authority staff really did a great job on um, building that project um, in the 90s. Unfortunately, did not you know continue forever. But we're we're excited to learn from that history and to revive it in some ways through through this art project. So if you check out our again, we'll come back to some of our programs. But the most recent out of the archives uh, episode also talks about this program in particular. If you're interested in this history. All right, let's keep going. Okay, I'm gonna uh, just hand it over to Lisa just really briefly to talk again about uh, some of the collaborations and um, partnerships. Yeah, um, so throughout this time that we've been in existence, our work has been informed by a lot of public scholarship, humanity scholars like Richard Rothstein, Beryl Satter, Amy Howard, Wanda Williams, um, and also the belief that public housing residents themselves are wellsprings of knowledge and information. And so us finding ways of bridging these communities through the work of artists um, and cultural workers. And so a real emphasis of this particular program of ours, Artists as Instigator, is to try and find ways that we can amplify the critical scholarship and public history and analysis that humanity scholars and people are putting out into the world, but perhaps not finding as big readership or of finding ways of amplifying their scholarship in a way that sort of clicks with the general public so that it's clear how this could perhaps like link to a reparations campaign or a just housing initiative or, you know, sort of new designs for um, people who are houseless or whatever it may be. And so um, for Artists as Instigator, we really want to encourage uh, the artists who are here and people who are thinking about applying of, you know, how is it that your work might be able to amplify the work of scholarship in a way that is transformative, that brings it into a more public um, sphere and engages people in more dynamic conversations. Yeah. Thank you. Did you want to share that this work is in that, that we've gotten a new funder? <laughs> oh yeah, I'll, I forgot. Sorry. Yeah, and we're really excited that um, the Mellon Foundation 
um, in particular, their Humanities in Action group um, is really excited about the Artist as Instigator um, project. And so they have given us multi-year funding to help support the work of the artists over the next three years. And so it's really going to enable us to have a really robust um not just like honorarium for the artists, but also the project that we all work together. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's great to, we love doing this work. We love even more when we have funding partners and, and, and different kinds of folks that are helping us make it happen. Um, and so I also wanted to talk just briefly about um, some of the other opportunities and we'll come back to this too at the end. Obviously we can only pick um, well, maybe it's not obvious, but uh, with this project, we only have capacity to choose only one artist as instigator to fully fund and collaborate with um, on a project per year. That said, you know, if you are not selected or if, you know, someone that you know um, applies for this and, and they're not selected, but you want to have a conversation about um, other ways to work together. We just wanted to highlight some of those things, both for artists as instigators and also folks that, you know, aren't selected, but that we get to know either through this process or in other ways. And so just to highlight a couple of the projects, major um, projects and programs that we have going on that we want to infuse and, and continue to infuse creativity and, and artistic kind of organizing and um, thinking through this lens of arts, culture, and public policy. I want to highlight our oral history archive, which is not yet public, but again, I mentioned out of the archives. Uh, so we are sharing stories through and uh, shout out to Mark who works directly and curates that um, podcast. Uh, you know, it, we have tons of episodes out there if you're interested in learning more about what's the archive, what kind of stories do we collect and tell. Um, but we are also building a website that will be interactive that will house um, you know, the full archive. And so not only uh, do we want that to be available, but we want it to be accessible and used and interacted with and, and engaging. And, um, you know, we need to collaborate with artists and organizers to understand that better. And so that's a project that we've already reached out to folks that we've met through this process uh, to do focus groups with us, to give us feedback, to share their projects, lessons learned, um, et cetera. Um, the Entrepreneurship Hub, program is another program I encourage you to check out. We've worked with both artists as instigators and also other um, folks uh, through the Entrepreneurship Hub to design and market and sell products um, made for, by, and with public housing residents, telling the stories of public housing residents. Um, so these are some of the examples of the merchandise, whether it's a t-shirt, um, either you know, designed or screen printed, uh, a zine series, there's different things that um, as a museum, we're interested in building up our uh, museum store, which is actually a cooperative that's owned with public housing residents. And so um, that's a collaboration we're interested in. Um, and also finalizing the museum design and that it will never be final. Um, so continuing to work and design and iterate uh, the museum space is where we're planning to open uh, next spring. And so working with artists um, like Dorothy Burge to design uh, a quilt that will be, uh, you know, designed from family photos of uh, important leaders from public housing. And so there's lots of different opportunities. You could see the facade of this rendering is very uh, colorful, and engaging. That's being done with uh, Amanda Williams and Olek and Jeyofu. So two artists that uh, we've been highly collaborative with over, again, like connecting uh, as a site of conscience, connecting, uh, you know, to the history of public housing. So those paint paint chips that you can barely see were actually pulled from the building. And, and that was like kind of the inspiration for, for their design. And we're thinking about, again, how this helps us um, advance, advance public housing and, and housing as a human right. Um, so these things are interesting to you, even if you were not selected, just want to plant some seeds so you all kind of understand some of the work that we're doing. Um, and yeah, I see the question in the chat too, and we'll definitely uh, circle back to that. So let's make sure not to lose that. Thanks, Sarah. Um, but we're gonna get through a couple more slides. I think we have our FAQ. Um, and yeah, just a reminder to apply, and that's uh, mphm.org backslash artist as instigator. Okay, so, and this, 
question in the chat is also a little bit uh, similar to this, um, but the just the overall thing that we we've had you know folks reach out and ask because up until last year at least all of our artists have been based in Chicago. Um, the answer is no. Uh, you do not have to live or work in Chicago. We haven't actually fully executed an artist as instigator project um, in another city, but we're definitely open to it. Um, and we would love to like think through what that might look like. Um, but right now, the only limitation that we have is that uh, we mostly for administrative reasons um, are working with artists who are based in the US, um, Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands, but also as a national museum, we are you know very much focused on American history. And so that's something that, um, you know, to note. Um, so if you applied in 2022, which there, you know, it was our first open call. I know there's a couple of people in the room who did. Um, you might have to reapply. Uh, so we're asking you to email me um, by Monday. If it comes in a few days late, I'll still respond. Uh, but we just really want folks to reach out as soon as possible if they're thinking about reapplying. Um, and the, the reason is that we want to work with you to determine whether or not you need to resubmit an application for this year or not. Um, the main shift from last year to this year is that we are looking for an artist that has a specific project in mind um, that is in or near the implementation phase uh, due to where we are currently as a museum and just what we're looking to do in the next year. Uh, it's really important to us that uh, the, the project is uh, conceptualized or at least has, um, you know, has the potential to be executed within a year. And so we're looking for specific project ideas, which we'll, we'll say a little bit more about that as well. Uh, so yeah, and here's that, that question, do I have to propose a specific project? And yes, uh, again, we are hoping that this cycle, uh, we will have um, an artist as instigator that is, I guess we could say like, more um, on the spectrum of, for example, the example that we gave of uh, Tanika Lewis Johnson, who came to us and basically was just like, I have this idea, I just need support, connections, um, thought partnership and the execution. Um, and then we were able to, you know, basically do a lot of work in a very short amount of time. Um, and so that will require you to have done some thought in, in terms of what is the, the communities that you wanna engage? What are some of the topics or issues that you're interested in? Um, and we can kind of help you to evolve it from there. But the idea is that you'd be able to implement it um, within you know, around a year. So just keeping that in mind. All right, is the residency open to guitarists? <laughs> to spoken word artists, for example. Uh, Yes. So no matter what your art form, media makers, um, we are very interested in hearing, you know, you don't also have to identify with any particular discipline. We're, we're interested in hearing what is creativity for you and your work, even if you are don't identify as an artist. So say you identify as a creative person, person who uh, does community work, an organizer who uses creative strategies. Um, we're really looking for, again, making that connection between the arts, culture broadly, um, and how we can utilize those tools to change pu public policy and so, um, and have conversations that, that spur action around um, particular policy issues. And so the idea is that, yeah, as long as you believe that housing is a human right and your, your work is aligned with the museum and it's, it's creative and, and can be a catalyst for this work um, or these conversations, we would love to hear how you define your, your art form. Yes, theater folks too. <laughs> um, appreciate, keep, keep the questions coming. We'll definitely scroll through and address those if we do not um, hit them in the FAQ. Um, so level of career development, uh, we're, we're thinking about this pretty loosely, but we do want to have folks apply who come with uh, some background or experience, demonstrated history of socially engaged projects. So it's more important to us that you have experience working with communities in, in meaningful ways and, and uh, can demonstrate that you understand kind of some of these um, challenges and issues with uh, engaging the public around public policy issues and, and bring that creativity and imagination and can demonstrate um, your experience with that. And, as opposed to thinking about, you know, 
have you have you shown your work in any particular institution that may be seen as uh, professional or established? Um, and so we're thinking about this broadly, but I think some some experience um, is is re is requested as uh, or is preferred. I should say will be um, will be helpful for your application to demonstrate some of the work that you've done um, as as close to aligned with this project as possible. And we will ask for a work sample. So um, that's a great place to demonstrate that. All right, people want to know how we are selecting the artists. Um, and we know a little bit more than we did last year. We're definitely building this as, as we go. So we appreciate your interest, your feedback. Also had a lot of conversations with applicants last year. And so we're trying to incorporate what we're learning um, as we go. And so this is not fixed. I just want to say that. But this is what we're imagining for this year. Um, so we'll start with a preliminary screening to confirm eligibility, things like, you know, are you based in the US? We've already gotten a couple of applicants from other countries, which we really appreciate and want to find a way to work with you in the future. Unfortunately, uh, this probably won't be the year, but um, we want to just kind of do a preliminary review of applications for things like that, um, as well as, yeah, is there a project proposal in there somewhere? Um, and then we will open it up to a diverse group of stakeholders uh, to evaluate the artists. And I'll share what the, the rubric is in just a minute. Um, but this will include you know, lots of different people. I will talk about that as well. Um, and then we'll do some phone conversations and reference checks with probably top three. That's what we did last year. You know, It'll probably depend a little bit on the pool, on who we talk to, um, how many we talk to. Um, and then from there, we'll select one artist. All right, who's on the select? So I'm just, I'm nodding at the questions coming in. I appreciate them, but we're just for time's sake, we're going to keep, keep moving and come back to the questions. Okay, so yeah, the selection community or committee um, could be considered a community uh, is basically people in the MPHM network um, could be some of you all if you come away from this and, and decide, actually, I don't think I'm going to apply or, or maybe you're here actually just to hear more because um, this is a program that you're thinking about um, being involved in in a different way. Uh, we are looking for people to help us with the review process. Um, and so we're building some of those relationships and have started reaching out to um, not only different members of our staff, but also uh, members of the community. Um, and particularly, you know, our uh, housing, public housing community, as well as artists, activists, other cultural workers who have experience and understanding um, and expertise to contribute to, to the review process. Um, and so once those this lists have been finalized, we do also share out who those people are for your reference. Yes, there is a rubric. Um, again, this is a little bit of a shift from last year because we're building it and we do have a little bit more clarity on what we're evaluating and how we're evaluating it. So I will share that. Um, basically, it's three kind of main areas that we're looking at. Uh, work quality, which again, as we define this, is not just in a, in a kind of narrow uh, way of only thinking about like artistic um, sort of merit or, you know, how many, <laughs> how many awards have you gotten um, or what, what institutions are you associated with, but really thinking about the overall kind of quality potential of um, impact and uh, looking particularly at the work samples um, and sort of what that social engagement looks like. Um, the link of arts and culture to public policy, so having understanding of generally um, how the work that you're doing is, you know, uh, can be leveraged for public policy change, speaks to public policy related issues, um, particularly around housing. Um, doesn't have to be public housing, but, um, you know, related to housing. And we do see housing as in some ways a portal or a lens to lots of different issues. So feel free to kind of expand on your connection or your interpretation of that as well um, in your application. And then again, the last thing, the project proposal is super important for us in particular this year, um, where we're really looking to help an artist uh, implement a project proposal that is, that's ready at, that's at that stage. Um, and so... Yeah, and then we also invite the reviewers to kind of give an overall score, which is, they're all pretty subjective, but the most subjective is probably the overall score. So they might look for things like, um, you know, your 
connections to public housing, although that's not a requirement. But if let's just say I'm a resident from New York and I, I want to see a NYCHA resident get it, I might give them a bump there. But that that will, I think, um, it all kind of shakes out. Uh, we just give um, the reviewers a little bit of latitude there with that, that overall score. So just transparency around that. All right, and that is the last of our FAQ questions. Just another reminder, July 21st is our um, deadline for this. Uh, we do wanna keep that pretty strict just because of our timelines. Um, everything that we're doing at the museum is you know, trying to uh, juggle a lot. So trying to keep things as tight as possible timeline-wise. So that will be the final deadline. We encourage you to get applications in even sooner to reach out. Um, as early as next week would be appropriate um, to just really start um, start the conversation and start to get, you know, if you have questions about the application, get those answered so that you don't have any issues. We do use a platform called Airtable. We can also drop that link in the chat before we get out. But um, if you go to this link that's on the screen, um, we can drop that as well. You will be able to see the link to apply and peruse it. We uh, encourage you to actually use like a Google Doc or a Word Doc to write out your answers um, and then put them in the application. There's a lot of different applications that encourage this process because you can't save the application and come back to it. So if you do a lot of work on it um, and then you close the screen, you'll lose that. So we, we recommend you put that in a separate document and copy paste. Uh, we also have a, a video submission option there are some questions you would have to fill in, but the majority of the qualitative answers you can answer through video if kind of a verbal or video uh, communication is, is your preferred format. There's no application fee. I'll just answer that one because I've just seen that really quick. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, I will- Do, do you want me on. to answer some of the questions that- Yeah, was, and let's drop the that. screen uh, or let's, yeah, stop sharing the screen um, so we can see people too. And I just dropped my- um, email in the chat. You can contact me directly if you have questions after this. I um, just want to say that in case people have to jump right at seven. Um, but yeah, let's get into some of the questions in the chat. Yeah, cool. So I'm just going to sort of answer some of the questions and not any any particular order. But um, someone asked about the $10,000 being more like seed funding. And I'll just let you know that we definitely see that initial 10K as kind of a foundation for the project. But I can maybe reveal that like for Tanika's project, we ended up raising over 100K for that project, you know, so like help working together, leveraging the fact that she was an artist as instigator. And that project itself now is also turning into hopefully a reparations bill that will be in city council and things like that, you know, so we don't, don't expect things to be just sort of like neat and tidy in one year. And we see this as us really trying to work with you to find as much funding as possible to realize whatever the project is. Um, someone had a question about whether this has to directly engage with public housing, and I would say definitely not. I mean, given what I was earlier say, uh, saying that um, we, as a site of conscience, we see housing as linked to so many different issues. Obviously, we are the you know National Public Housing Museum, and so if it touches on public housing, then that is helpful for the application and helpful for the way that we are understanding the policy impact. But I mean, I think it's sort of, you can cast a really broad network. I mean, a lot of, I mean, a lot of our work, for example, is also with um, people who are incarcerated, thinking about abolition. I mean, people who are living um, in prisons, unfortunately, are also like a form of public housing in the United States. It's like so invested in more than even traditional public housing, you know, so we see it as a really broad framework. Um, and then there was a question about um, whether you will get feedback. Last year, I just have to say, I mean, TIFF was like, did a heroic effort and really met with every single artist to explain if they wanted like sort of what their feedback was. We're gonna try and give everybody some sort of feedback. I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to meet with everybody as we did last time, but as much as possible, we'll try to you know give you feedback and things like that. Um, and also Tiff, Sarah, somebody asked like, if you have multiple ideas, 
um, can they write you? And I would say that's a, definitely a good idea, like to sort of send an email as soon as possible with the ideas. And we want to help you make a successful proposal and we'll help sort of you figure out which one is like the best one for this particular um, project. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great thing. Um, I mean, the other option is to put multiple ideas in the application, there is a word limit, but if you can be clear and concise and have a couple of different things that you're serious about executing, um, we'd love to, you know, to, to look through those um, within the application itself as well. Um, I wanted to address, and sorry, Sarah, or um, Lisa and Sarah, if this was already addressed, but Sarah Sadler asked about budding artists with lots of activism. Do you offer any strategy help like creating a viable business model? Or does that need to be ready at application? I want to say a little bit about this. I can't fully disclose it because we're still building it. But I mentioned earlier the entrepreneurship hub. And I really do think this could be like maybe a project for you to think about um, for that program. So the entrepreneurship hub um, right now is, is being um, built in collaboration with a working group of six public housing residents. They will also be uh, the founding members of the uh, corner store co-op, which will be the museum store. Um, but they are currently designing a workshop series, which will also uh, culminate with a pitch competition. So they're, they'll be teaching folks who are doing some of this work how to um, create market and sell their products and actually build a partnership. So if you're looking for like a business model type um, opportunity and opportunity to collaborate with the museum in particular, that could be the opportunity for you. And we would love to just stay in touch as that evolves. That may not be what you're asking, but uh, I just want to throw that out there anyway, because I think this is a great group to, to share that with. Um, that's something that we're also working on. So again, if it's not a fit for this project, we do review all the applications with other opportunities in mind and do try to share those. And so just something to, to keep in mind. Okay, do we answer them all? Are there more? I think so. I mean, I not. I think some of the people sent um, questions just to you. I'm I'm seeing only a certain ones, you know. Okay, I'm not seeing any of my direct message, but feel free to bump them up or just come off mute. I think at this point, um, we're happy to. We have a small enough group. But I think we can moderate the conversation if if y'all want to jump in. Otherwise, you know, we're two minutes after. I think we did pretty good. <laughs> if you all agree. Awesome. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us, you all. And I can't wait to see your work and your ideas. Um, and, you know, thanks for making the world more beautiful and more just. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, and just hang on really quickly because I'm not sure we got that uh, last link in the chat. Um, so I just want to. Get that uh, for folks who may not be able to access it. So the link to apply is there. Um, and then also just want to drop a couple of other opportunities to join the museum's um, programming, check out some of our content. Um, we have uh, an event next week. Some of you are in Chicago, some of you are not. Some of you might be visiting this summer. We have a big concert on August 25th. So these are all just great ways uh, to connect with us. There will not be another info session, but this is being recorded and it will be uploaded to YouTube. Um, and so in about a week, uh, we'll be emailing this out to everyone who registered for this, as well as um, posting it and sharing it generally, social media and through our newsletter. So again, if you know people who this may be um, a good opportunity for, you can forward it, or if you wanna rewatch it, kind of remind yourself of uh, what was shared, that will be available to you all throughout the process. Great. Yeah. Feel free to follow up directly. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Take care.